welcome everybody to uh, the sixth of the Create HDR sessions. Um, it's really wonderful to see so many of you here um, today. For those of you who've um, joined us for the first time, welcome to the um, Create HDR sessions. And for those of you who've been attending, um, a really warm welcome back. So I'd like to um, begin by acknowledging country. I'm on the land of the Darawal people and pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging and recognise their continuing connection to land, water and culture. And I extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who are with us today. Um, so I invite you to introduce yourself in the chat. You might like to acknowledge the land that you're joining us from um, today as well. And just a reminder that um, these sessions are recorded and you can access them afterwards um, on the CREATE um, YouTube channel um, if you'd like to, to go back and revisit any aspects of the, the presentation. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Kate Smythe. Um, Kate is a lecturer in Human Society and its Environment K-6 Curriculum and Curriculum Studies at the University of Sydney. And she also coordinates the fourth year BED primary degree and she's a recipient of a Faculty of Education and Social Work Teaching Excellence Award at the University of Sydney. And she's also the New South Wales State winner of the Discovering Democracy Achievement Award. Oh All those bits and pieces that I've found out about. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. Yeah. So her teaching and research interests include history, technology, epistemic fluency, teacher education and professional development. And for her recently completed PhD, Kate investigated how primary teachers develop epi epistemic fluency in history. And her Master of Education research examined the sources and nature of primary teachers' historical thinking and understanding. So Kate's very um, kindly offered to present for us today. And Kate, we're so thrilled and really appreciative that you've taken time to share with us this afternoon, particularly if you, as you've um, had such recent experience with the PhD journey. Um, so I know that many of you will have um, potentially questions and wonderings and curiosities. Feel free to pop um, any of those into the chat or Kate's kindly said we can interrupt um, and, and ask questions throughout. Um, and we'll have time, of course, at the end to um, ask questions and to, to um, you know, explore some of the aspects that she's shared with us today. So without any further ado, Welcome, Kate, and thanks once again for sharing with us today. It's lovely to have you join us. Thank you so much. It's um, just a privilege and an honour to be with you today. And I'd like to also acknowledge that I am on Aboriginal land that was never ceded. I am um, live and work on Gadigal land, and um, I also pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. And um, yes, I was um, in your situation not long ago where um, listening to someone who just finished their PhD and thinking, I'll never get there, I'll never get there. And, um, and I must acknowledge that my amazing supervisor, Professor Robin Ewing is here and um, she has, she was incredibly supportive of my work and um, and I regard her as a, a true mentor and friend. So thank you for being here, Robin. And um, yes, yeah, so I'm happy if you want to ask questions as we go along. Um, I didn't know, it's, it's quite um, challenging to fit into 20 minutes, um, eight years of work. I found. So I'm I'm going to do my best, but um, we probably won't get through it. But I thought I'd just, um, I was talking to Susan just the other day about, you know, some of the things that I found useful, and I don't know whether you will find them useful, but, um, you know, there's different ways to skin a cat, as they say. So there are different ways to approach your PhD. But yeah, I would like to share um, what my study was and why um, and I still feel very passionate about my research and um, because I um, work in primary teacher education and I come from a primary teaching background and I work with um, I'm the hub school coordinator for um, 
the university um, working with DEC schools. So I still have a one foot in the classroom, so to speak. And I have the joy of teaching on um, the Masters of Teaching program and the um, Bachelor of Education program. Um, Alison's just arrived, so hi, Ali. Um, yeah, so it's um, my, I guess my study, and I'm just gonna show um, a PowerPoint, but yeah, just to see. So I've called it Sense-Making and Practice in a Disciplinary World. That's part of the title that I used for my thesis. Um, and Susan asked me the other day, how did you, when did you start using that title? And it was sort of later in the, in, in my PhD journey that I suddenly, it made sense to me um, that that's what I was doing and looking at. And for primary teachers that, idea of a disciplinary world is um, quite unusual for a primary teacher who's like me, who's trained as a generalist. We're not trained as subject specialists, but we're um, prepared and um, educated. And um, we our practice is very multidisciplinary and making connections for students rather than just teaching a very siloed thing. The reason I've called it that is that it was um, it was the context that this works emerged. So the idea of an Australian curriculum that um, was going to be disciplinary based and it impacted primary teachers considerably because they already teach across a range of subjects in the primary curriculum, but the new syllabus the new syllabuses, I should say, um, and within the Australian curriculum wanted or demanded that um, things change. It wasn't going to be multidisciplinary. It was going to be very disciplinary focused. And I was just shocked at for primary teachers that their workload in implementing not just new syllabuses, but new ways of knowing in the primary it seemed to be very overwhelming for them and very um confusing for a lot of people as well um and you know not only were classroom teachers dealing with the implementation of multiple new syllabus documents all at once they were also grappling with a, teaching a style of curriculum that they didn't necessarily identify with or um uh, understood. For a lot of primary teachers, it seemed like they were being asked to implement a secondary style um, syllabus. Um, and so it was very challenging. And when I, one of the things I was doing when I started at the end of my master's was I was a primary advisor for the Australian curriculum for ACARA. And I was one of two primary teachers for the whole country. And we, she was from WA and I was from New South Wales. And, but we shared a common way of looking at the world that was very primary based. And um, so um, we were both very keen to have a primary teacher's voice in, in um, the, the curriculum. So that's the context. And um, at the time I was working also um, at Sydney University, but also in the professional learning um, space, doing some work in some schools in Northern New South Wales. And that work has still continued um, uh, throughout. So it's been a 10, 11 year um, partnership, if you like. Um, so one of the things that I really wanted to look at was this idea of primary teachers' knowledge and how they were, if there wasn't any uh, room for them to be um, exposed to the disciplines, how were they going to be asked to implement disciplinary-based syllabuses? And I was very, I know from my work with primary teachers that they see themselves as generalists. They don't see themselves as a subject spe specialist usually, but they are very 
very passionate about their work and I I you know was very um worried that there was this going to be this top-down approach to professional development for primary teachers where it was they were then seen as um the um not as the expert but as the um somehow def deficit in their their knowledge and I knew that that wasn't right wasn't correct so one of the questions that I was really interested in was this relationship between primary teachers' social and personal views about historical knowledge and knowing. And how did they, what did they have in mind when they thought about history? Um, and what are the ways that we can um, design professional learning experiences where it is a co-presented, co um constructed space so it wasn't just me delivering professional learning it was more about us working together to um, construct knowledge um, so they were my questions and they've they've been tweaked tweaked from the initial part of my phd but i think it's that first one that stayed mainly the same so when I, so that idea of this relationship between primary teachers knowledge, so there's some, I'm going to teach you a few, or I'm going to introduce a few terms such as epistemology, which is really talking about the theory of knowledge and understanding. So once I started to, to think about that, that's when I did a lot of reading. And I'm sure as PhD students, you are, um, really on that trail of um, searching for studies and theories and literature. Um, I Someone said to me, I think I read it actually in Pat Thompson's book, where she described the literature review as a dinner party and to think about it as a way, who would you invite to your dinner party to talk about or um, think about your research question? So I was thinking, okay, well, who could I invite, you know, to talk about this at my dinner party, metaphorical dinner party? And um, that's when I had, on one end of the table, I had researchers who were focused on personal epistemology and that idea of how individuals make sense of the world. Um, and then on the other side of the table was this idea of social epistemology. And, you know, from a socio-cultural perspective there. So there were two sort of arms, I guess, of my um, literature review that um, I spent a lot of time developing. So this idea of how do we how do we explain how people and groups construct knowledge? So as a teacher, how do I um, construct new knowledge and um, how does that relate to what I already know? So they were my, that was sort of the, the framework that I used to start with. So when I started to look at a situative perspective on cognition. So, so this idea of personal epistemology, there's lots of different theories, but the one that I settled on that seemed to resonate with me was this idea of a situated perspective on cognition that says everyone, um, that all thinking is situative. It's not just based on your developmental or your beliefs it's it's all our thinking is situative and I think for primary teachers that's really important you know that that we see ourselves as part of a social community um, and this perspective also helps account for variability so I thought that was really useful um, and it also helps us or informs the way we think about how we um, generate knowledge in different situations. So that was so that was um, quite an important theory. 
And then the other one, the social one, was this idea of, well, what's a discipline? What is a discipline? And so, you know, drawing on this idea that, um, that it's not just a collection of facts. We're not learning particular skills, specific skills, and that's it. We're not just collecting facts about history. It's part of the activity of uh, disciplines, the activity and the culture that we're um, working. There's a... There's particular ways of doing things within disciplines. And um, when we um, to participate in a discipline, we don't necessarily have to know the, um, the um, particular skills like historical skills or scientific skills. We also need to be able to talk about it. So that idea of discourse and, and language is really important. So I like the idea of this, I, that disciplinary knowledge is situated within an activity it's not it's not um it's not and that is important i think when we're talking about a particular classroom situation and this is where i came across this notion of epistemic fluency which is the capacity to understand switch between and combine different kinds of knowledge and different ways of knowing about the world so um, if you think about what Morrison and Collins said back in 1995, they said that an important goal of schools is to help students become epistemically fluent across a range of disciplines. But what are the implications then for primary teachers who do teach a range of disciplines? How do they enable their students to um, understand and switch between different um, types of knowledge. So that was another quite important um, um, theory that I was wanting to pursue. And that's when I got myself into a bit of a mess. And um, I had so many readings and just, it was, it felt like it was just so confusing. And it was at this time when I went to Ikea with my and um which is an experience you would all agree I'm sure but um I remember getting our house for sale and going to Ikea by myself and then coming home with nothing basically some fairy lights and um useless stuff and I was just overwhelmed and exhausted and then I happened to be speaking to my sister-in-law, who's a, um, a designer um, and an architect um, but specialises in interior design, and she's also really good at IKEA. She uses IKEA a lot, and she said, I'll take you. So we were. it was in those um, aisles of IKEA that I suddenly thought, this is what it's like to step into a disciplinary world. It's a way of knowing that world. It's a way of doing things that for someone like me, I was completely, um, I knew a bit about it, but I didn't know an efficient way of doing it. And I thought, well, that's what an expert does. They have, if you're a disciplinary expert, it's not necessarily that you know every single thing about the discipline. It's that you've got these ways of thinking and knowing about the world that help you um, build knowledge in that discipline. So as I was walking around IKEA, you know, Lisa, my sister-in-law, she's got things like she knows where to park, she um, knows the shortcuts through IKEA, she, you know, let her sightsee, she knows exactly what she wants, but she also has this formal way of looking at it where she knows what would suit my house, my context, my situation. So and I was thinking, well, you know, IKEA with all its processes and it's it's got its own language. It's um, you know, it's it's a culture. And then I thought, well, that's really what I'm talking about. That we step when we're asking primary teachers to teach in disciplinary ways, they're stepping into these different worlds where they might have a little bit of knowledge or everyday understandings, but what does it mean to be an expert in those disciplines? So 
I use this idea of a metaphor um, for this relationship between personal and social epistemology. Um, so it was this idea of um, being, it gave me a way of thinking about what I was doing in my research. And um, yeah, so that's sort of basis. And then what I did then was once I'd sort of done my theoretical, the literature review, I think it's that was one of the most important chapters for me, that it was just really important to get the theory there. And I spent a lot of time there. And then um, thinking about the research, the methodology that I wanted to do, um, I really wanted it to align, everything to align. So I, one of the ways I started to think about it was this idea of um, the research paradigm as like a genetic code, the DNA. So it's, it's, it, it was um, not only my paradigm wasn't just what I was going to study, but also how I would approach what I was studying. So how my own ideas and beliefs about how knowledge is produced, how it's represented, how I establish truth. So it sort of links back to that idea of epistemology, I guess. Um, and then, um, you know, I wasn't interested in quantifying primary teachers' knowledge, but I wanted to understand the qualities of their knowledge. I wanted to understand the characteristics. And I um, also assumed that they would have very diverse and very variable qualities of their knowledge and ways of knowing. And that's based on a lot of the research that's been done um, by Peter Satius and people like that, that, you know, that this idea of historical consciousness, if you're not trained in history, you will still have an understanding of the past and um, that that's shaped by, you know, your um, taste in movies or books or family and experiences like that. It's not always just based on formal education. Um, so I, you know, then I also wanted this idea of to be able to interpret um, that this idea of in, being interpretive, that we are, the assumption is that knowledge is multiple, it's subjective, it's socially constructed, as opposed to um, um, one way of, uh, one body of knowledge. So you know, from that stance, the aim of the study is to make sense of how the different individuals in the study, um, what the relationship between their personal and social epistemologies were. Um, and I think one of the threads that goes through is this idea of about knowledge that, you know, that we assume that people hold and use um, different types of knowledge and um, and they have different ways of making sense of the world. Um, I used this idea of knowledge, you know, it could have included um, disciplinary knowledge and justified pro propositions, but it's also the idea that we have, um, we also use and hold ways of knowing different aspects of knowledgeability, such as um, having a hunch about something or um, having a value about something. So, you know, there's a different ways of um, thinking about truth and reality and that it's constructed. Um, and then what I really thought about in the research design was, and I liked what Yin says here, that research design is the logic that links the data to be collected and the conclusions to be drawn to the initial questions of the study. And so, you know, I wanted to show in this slide that the question um, that what is the relationship between primary and teachers, social and personal views of historical knowledge and blah, 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 how that links into the big ideas, the concepts in the thesis, as well as the theories that underpin the thesis that, you know, that question 
I needed to have some literature that was focusing on social epistemology. And then I also needed some literature that could illuminate personal knowledge. Um, and then, so then my methodology that I chose had to align with those two earlier things of the study. So, you know, um, that's why I chose case study methodology because my intention was to be able to um, describe and understand the experiences of teachers. Um, and I, um, so in this research, um, the various participants, so six participants um, who took part in one instance, so it was one day of um, a professional learning workshop uh, based on process, a process drama, um, and working with a teach, uh, a professor Peter O'Connor in New Zealand, who is um, a very well known um, uh, drama um, pedagogue. So he um, he was involved as well. So my one instance, I guess, um, is. And I liked what Peter Freebody said, the goal of a case study in its most general form is to put in place an inquiry in which both researchers and educators can reflect upon particular instances of educational practice. So this one day, um, it was a, a chance to um, do something together. So this practical idea of working together and then reflecting on it. So we, I called um, this day an intervention um, and it was a one day history workshop using drama rich pedagogy for primary teachers. Um, it was held in Yamba, which is a pretty great place to do research. Um, and there were, I think, 40 primary teachers who came and of those 40, um, six volunteered to be um, part of that. Um, the research that went before and after. Um, we also had at the day some museum ed educators, cons curriculum consultants and some teachers from the nearby secondary school. So I've been working with St James and the um, uh, Catholic Education Office up there for, for I think 11 years now and um, so I on professional development for teachers. And it was that, that I really wanted to, um, one of the things that I think came through in feedback earlier was that teachers didn't have enough time to talk and to plan. So I really wanted this day to be um, much more about collaboration um, as well. So the setting, and I've, I've called it a, a shared epistemic space from Marcus Guyton Buji, which is his idea of a professional learning activity as a shared epistemic space um, that um, enables individuals and groups to recognize different ways of knowing and forms of knowledge. So, and we were co-creating epistemic practices and professional knowledge. So that idea of epistemic it comes from the word epistemology. It's the practical. It's the practical um, part of knowledge, if you like. So it's it's to do so. Knowledge practices, co-creating knowledge practices, and professional knowledge. So it was about them developing an understanding of history, but also that that um, professional knowledge as well for their particular context, for their students, for their situation um and um yeah so I had six participants um and the reason I only had six was that one of my aims was to really do a fine grained analysis there's a lot of research that says um you know people learn through experiences as um, and we know that, you know, we know that people work, learn in social settings, but I really wanted to know what um, teachers were taking away from that particular, from at an activity level. So it wasn't just the day, but I went in a more fine grained activity level and also um, 
I wanted to see what individuals were taking away, how they were constructing knowledge. Um, and they were from um, different ages and stages of their teaching career. Um, none of them had had any formal um, education in or back, educational background in history. We also had the expert. So like Lisa, the IKEA expert or a historian who's a history expert, I had Peter O'Connor, who was the drama expert. And he used a poem um, based as a pretext. It was called In Flanders Fields. Um, and he had written a process drama around this, this work. Um, and the idea was we would use it with teachers to talk about um, war and how we teach commemoration. So the methods that I use for data collection, so there were um, a pre-intervention um, interview, and as you can see there, it's an epistemic interview. So it's an interview that was really looking at teachers' knowledge and ways of knowing. Um, then we had the day, so that was um, a full day. And then a post intervention, which was the um, some were the following day and some were two weeks later. Um, so that was with participant teachers. Um, I also interviewed Peter O'Connor and um, the principal. Um, and I used a lot of, I, I did record the um, workshops, the, the intervention, but I just wanted that just for my own. Um, um, reflection. I didn't analyse the video as such. And also these ongoing um, professional conversations with the principal. Um, so, and that's still going even now. So, um, you know, in the interviews, the first interview was really, um, I um, was really interested in what the teachers were saying about um, history, what their um, professional background or professional learning, had they done many, um, had they studied history at university or part of their teacher education? Um, do they like teaching history? Um, was history important in their family? What sort of things can they remember? You know, if they, a lot of, um, a couple of them had, for example, you know, um, Anzac Day was a very big thing in their families. And so that was part of, you know, their experiences. So then after the intervention, the second one was I was really interested, um, and this is where I had um, some open-ended questions that I was interested in what they had taken away from the experience. So, you know, what aspects, and I went down to a finer grain level about particular activities that Peter O'Connor used, you know, what what activity worked best for you and what did you notice um, about that? Um, and what was your on your mind um, during different um, strategies that Peter had and what were you noticing? So it generated a huge amount of data and <laughs> I think this is the thing, you know, that um, you think, oh, I've only got, you might only have a couple of participants, but with qualitative research, you can generate a lot of data. But the challenge, I guess, is to make good data. And how do you do that? Um, I'd encourage you to read Richard's there, um, how to um, really um, make sure that your um that huge volume of data can be useful to you in answering your questions. Um, I use two forms of analysis. So I, um, the fine, that's the idea of fine grain. So even at the word level, I was interested in, I was interested in the concepts that teachers held and used, the way they used a concept. Um, so I used, um, Verbal, verbal analysis, um, which was um, interesting. And then this idea of interpretative um, phenomenological ana analysis or IPA, which is um, Flowers, I think, and Smith. But um, 
and that was to make sense of the experiences the teachers had. So not only what they said verbally, but then how did what was coming through in terms of the experience. So I focused on the content of what the participants said about history and the concepts they held and used. So concepts held and used formally. So what was in their mind? What did they have in mind about history? Then also concepts, you know, what did they, what practical ideas did they hold? How did they use a concept to explain what they, um, their knowledge? And then I'll just briefly show you what I did then. So I created, once I'd done my analysis, I then created or wrote vignettes. So small um, background, like almost like a description um, in my own words. Um, and, um, but then I also had, you know, this is just a quick example, but had their, their utterance there. And um, um, and that was then I would analyze um, those using um, those the idea of IPA and verbal analysis. So if you if you looked um, at this particular extract, you know I, things that I noticed. You know she had an expected quietness or stillness in a professional learning concept. She describes the surprise of being still and standing in a freeze um, frame, reflecting in just that silence. She talks about the classroom context and the professional learning context. And she is really explicit when she's thinking about the classroom context. So those sorts of things emerged, I guess. Those findings emerged once I started to really closely look at things. Um, and this idea of silence and quietness and and um, was one of the things that was really interesting to me that this, you know, this, um, that teachers feel like they never have that space. They never have this time to think and to, to reflect and to notice and to feel, you know. Like. Um, I then started to look at the patterns of sense making and one of the examples with Alice was that, and the other, and the other teachers as well, but they would break down this concept of um, um, deconstructing an idea. So that came through um, in that. So that finer grained um, uh, way of looking at um, data and analysing it. And then when you start to look at that relationship between the personal and the, the socials, I remember then my question again, this idea of, you know, there were social ways of know, knowing that were embodied. We could look, sort of look at something or we had to sort of stand in a freeze. Um, but then there was also this per, very personal one way too and this idea of being still and you can slightly open your eyes and, you um, so that was where that relationship, I could start to see this relationship between the personal and the social. Um, yeah, so I think that's probably enough from me um, now. I didn't want to, I think I'll probably talk for too long, but. Um, you have yeah. it at all, Kate. What um, an amazing presentation and just um, so interesting. Your, your research is just so interesting. Um, thank you so much for, for sharing. Um, I know that um, many of us were jotting down thoughts and ideas and, and, um, and wondering. So um, I'll open it up now to anyone who may have a, a question or a, an aspect that you'd like to um, explore a little further with Kate, feel free to um, either unmute or um, pop a, um, a question in the chat. We'll just um, take a breath for a moment and let Kate take a breath as well. Yeah, okay, sorry, I've just uh, spoken at you for a long time. So not at all, not at all. So many, um, so many wonderings I have, but I'll, I'll hold off on my ones until um, people have had an opportunity to um, to either ask a question or, or make a comment. Is there anyone who'd like to um, to share a wondering? Uh, Beck looks like she's I'm waiting frantically. Fire away, Beck. It was something you said really early, Kate, about um, 
when you were introducing this idea of sense making and practice in a disciplinary world and you're talking about a secondary style of teaching that there was kind of something that was that was emerging that that this this primary frame that you've had to teach you before kind of was now going to require a secondary style of teaching I'm just wondering if you can kind of unpack that a little bit more for me I'm unclear on kind of I think I have a sense but I, I don't yeah. have a good enough understanding of what you mean in that yeah so this idea of secondary school culture is really different to a primary school culture I think um and Robin and I had this conversation with um about you know it's almost like a discipline a primary classroom is like a discipline in that there's a way of doing things in that primary classroom that are different to a secondary classroom. Mm -hmm. There's a way of seeing the world that's really different. So rather than being a subject specialist, uh, primary teachers see themselves and believe that they are primary teachers first and then responsible for um, their students. Well, they, a lot of them would see student well-being way more um, important than um, what, what they're teaching. And um, I think, you know, primary teachers are, um, and I'm not making a judgment, of, you know, either way, but I think there is, I think this different way of seeing a knowledge as well in the primary context that I don't think was recognised by the curriculum writers. Mm. Um, when they did the, when they, um, came up with this idea, I think primary approaches were sort of tacked on at, in the end rather than being there first. I, would you agree with that, people? Susan's not. Yeah, yeah, very much so, very much so. Yeah, that, that um, I guess sort of I would describe it as sort of transdisciplinary um, rather than disciplinary. Yeah, very um, much. Mm -hmm. um, does that answer um yeah 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 that's I just I kind of had a sense you were talking about more an interdisciplinary kind of yeah it does answer the question thank you yeah and I think with primary teachers you know they were told that you can't so for example in the the learning area that I have HSIE in the past it was very much um this a, a multidisciplinary approach mm. And I'm not saying that has to happen, but I think that primary teachers are really good at teaching conceptually and integrating and making connections with kids. Yeah. Um, and I'm not saying secondary aren't, but I think it's part of the way that we do things mm. in a primary class. Well, I mean, the, the primary teachers were told they had to be subject specialists, you know, you had to teach maths, then you had to teach science, then you had to teach geography, then you had to, and, you know, it's a very, it's timetabled differently, even at that level. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Kate. Thanks. Thanks for joining us, Sally. Fire away. I'm, I'm sitting in the hallway. <laughs> Is that where you are? I can see you. I've, got, I've got an echo. I probably. <laughs> you can come in here now if you like. <laughs> you can probably share the screen. We can share. We can share the screen. <laughs> now, I, I was just going to say, I was going to say, Dr. Smythe, that one of the things that you argue that's really interesting in the work that we do together and the work we do with Robin too, is um, drawing on that that great affordance of primary style. To, um, you know, that ease of interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity that um, secondary teachers, I don't think it's a reluctance, I think it's a function of the very siloed curriculum mm. um, that we're given to teach and the way that we're timetabled and, and that very reductive view back mm. uh, that, you know, I always say to my pedagogy and practices three students, and, in fact, we had it as, as an assessment for years in pedagogy one, you had to go and look, observe a primary class mm. and look at the integration, the intersection. Mm. And I think, you know, Kate's thesis and her argument has so much to actually offer a secondary context because it transcends those barriers um, 
for us. And mm. let's face it, that's what the research is telling us about um, the way we're actually going to be able to flourish mm. in, you know, in, mm. in the new century, not mm. so new century, and certainly post-COVID. I think, thank you, Sit on, I can go back to the hallway. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you, Alison. Um, one of the things I think I've learned from working with secondary is that they do love their subject areas. Mm. I often tell, and I think um, Parker J. Palmer talks about fall in love with a subject because that will sustain you, you know, and, you know, maybe that's one of the things that I think with primary teachers, when you're a primary teacher, it's good to have a passion about something, you know, create, being dance or mathematics or whatever it is, whatever rocks your boat, find something that really you can be passionate about because that, I think, sustains you long-term. Mm. So, um, yeah, so I think, you know, this idea of primary and secondary is interesting um, that, you know, that we can learn from each other. Like I'm, I'm in awe of, you know, watching a secondary person teach in depth, you know, something, and I'm not saying primary don't, but it's that we still, in primary, I think we need to have this sort of um, understanding of the disciplines. I do think that, you know, what does a scientist do? How do they construct knowledge? How do you, um, how are you critical in making sense of what you read or whatever? You know, I think that's really important. Mm. Beautiful. Any other questions or wonderings or comments? Feel free to to either unmute or oh, we've got a couple of questions here um, in the chat. There, Kay, can you explain the difference between epistemology and ontology? Oh yes. yes. Okay. Yes, I can. So if you think about ontology as being what there is, if you like, um, so. So the so the world, what there is, the world, and then epistemology as a way of knowing that world, I guess. Mm. Would that be clear enough? Anna asked the question. Anna asked the question. I just realised I got a whole PhD and fudged that entirely and never really <laughs> figured it out, so... <laughs> Thank you for I, telling I me. Always, I think it's hard to remember, Anna, but... I always think <clears throat> knowledge is knowledge is um, how you think about the nature of knowledge of of what knowledge is the knowing, and ontology is um, your understand your epistemology is thinking about the nature of knowing, yeah. and yeah. ontology is being being oh, okay. So, well, that's just how I yeah. Think. But Thank other you. people might have a better way of remembering. <laughs> yeah, and like your ontology, or so when you're looking at the world, your so my ontology comes. I guess it's made how I um, what I see the world as. I think as well is important. Mm, mm. And and how yourself I, in the world. And yourself in the world, yes. Mm. And that's I think you know primary teachers ontology then is um, important when we're talking about knowledge and curriculum and what we're teaching and how we teach you. I think that's an important um, discussion to have. And when curriculum writers are writing curriculum. Mm. Mm. Primary, primary going right back to the Plowden report mm. was, was about primary teachers being um, knowing the whole child yes so the most important thing was was knowing who you were working with knowing your learners and who they were as individuals and then being able to meet their needs about knowing you know because you understood where they were at whereas yes secondary's tradition is much more about um you know as you said before um, your knowledge of the discipline itself and, and the way secondary schools are often structured, mm -hmm. it's very hard to have that knowledge of the whole person, the whole learner, 
because you're dealing with so many different um, learners over, mm. a, you know, a week or, or two weeks. Mm. But sadly, I think what's also happened is that primary and early childhood as well became second and third cousins mm. to secondary Oh. And yet, in actual fact, it should be the other way around. Oh. Mm. That's my opinion. <laughs> that's that's my some of my ontology. <laughs> yes, yeah, so it would have been a very different, um, really different curriculum, I think, had they not forgotten primary initially. So it was, it you know, I think it was very much okay. We've got to look at you know secondary and. Um, especially in New South Wales, you know, the Board of Studies had a lot to, to say with uh, mm-hmm. this is being recorded somewhere. <laughs> Any other comments or, or questions or wonderings that you'd like to, to ask Kate? Um, just checking the chat there. I've just got one little thing that I'm just going to love, share a bit of love, and I just love the idea of the lit review as a dinner party. I just think yeah. that is just so, like, who would you invite to your dinner party? That is just such a clarifier. So I just want to, like, thank you for sharing that because it's yeah. really such a lovely frame and it kind of takes a little bit of the angst and the pressure out of it, but it just it's such a lovely way to actually make sense of a lit review, like, Who's each in a party and where do you sit them? Like I just see it. Yeah, like, where do you put them? Who's yeah. next to you? Who <laughs> do you want to plan? <laughs> and what are and we how do they relate to each other too? Yeah. So, you know, yeah. with mine, it was like the social and the personal, but they had to relate to each other. Oh. So, you know, and that's where I came up with this situ well, drew on situative yeah. perspective on cognition that seemed to um, you know, go well with mm. the idea of the discipline what we were trying to do in you know with primary teachers teaching in history in their classroom you know Mm -hmm. and it's so interesting going back over the data about you know what the teachers were saying about they really know their kids you know they will say that will work with that child that will I can see that really working with Mm. kindergarten you know they Yeah. yeah any other questions or comments from from people I'd love to just add on to, to what um, Beck mentioned there around the uh, the metaphor of the, the dinner party. And I a noticing that I had, Kate, when you were talking was just actually how much metaphor helped you in your own sense making throughout the PhD journey. And I, I thought that was really interesting. You, you, you seem to draw upon metaphor in your own sense making throughout your PhD journey. That was a noticing. And I'm, I'm just curious as to whether you were aware of that at the time or is that something that's clearer now having reflected on your journey it's interesting because I went looking after I the Ikea metaphor Hmm. and also the DNA like that helped having that but I did find a really I'll just share my screen again this is um a um can you read that is that big enough so this idea of metaphors in language appear to in I haven't got my glasses on instantiate frame consistent knowledge structures and invite structurally consistent inferences. Mm. Far from being mere rhetorical flourishes, metaphors have profound influences on how we conceptualize and act with respect to important societal issues. So yeah, I thought that idea of a structure, it gave me a structure, I think, mm-hmm. you know, like a conceptual structure. Um, that, it, And it was interesting how, you know, and I use IKEA with my own students, teaching them about history and geography. And I say, it's, you know, it's like, and it seems to work, like they go, oh, yeah, that makes sense, you know. it's, it's, And that idea of stepping into a world and it's, um, and I think what Peter O'Connor and other drama experts like Robin and Ali do is they bring you into this world where there you've got the opportunity to work with different disciplines. So Alison and I have done this lot of work with um, history and drama and, um, you know, that idea of creating this space 
through this drama epistemic space mm -hmm. where you can bring in different disciplines. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's that structure that also, so, you know, it helps, it helped primary teachers organise their thinking. So it's like a metaphor. It helps you organise your thinking. So one of the things that the primary, the participants were talking about were this at a specific activity level. So some of the strategies that Peter would do, they would, that gave them a structure to be able to think and make sense and organise their own knowledge. Yes. Mm. Yeah. That fascinating. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. Um, everyone, if, if there are no further questions, um, I'd like you just to join me now in thanking Kate for what was a, such an insightful and interesting presentation. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank really you. appreciate. Really Thank appreciate. you for coming. Thank you. <laughs> it's been in, invaluable. And uh, and what a great um, discussion that was generated afterwards. So, so big yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. And please don't hesitate to email me if you've got any Oh, if you want a reference list or anything like that, I didn't have time to put that on the slide, so I might pop that on for you. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Kate. Really appreciate it. Um, so for those of you who've been coming along to the sessions um, quite regularly, you'll see that sometimes we have um, one of ourselves um, share an aspect of our research, and that offer is open to anyone who'd like the opportunity to, to share an element of their research or even have just a practice go at, at presenting to the group. Um, it's a safe space and a brave space, so you're always really welcome to, um, to take up that opportunity. Um, you can just email me and um, I can slot you into to one of the sessions. And one of the processes that we've been using um, as a way of, of sharing our research is the Pecha Kucha or Pachucha. Um, and I can give you a little bit of information about that um, if you're interested. Um, it's just a, a rapid fire, a quick way of, of sharing um, your research journey, um, 20 slides with a 20 second narration. Um, and if you go back to some of the earlier YouTube um, sessions that we've had, you'll see a few examples of them um, as well. So the offer is always there, no compulsion, but um, you're very welcome. If you'd like an opportunity to um, to share some of your research and, and to have some questions and some feedback and discussion. Um, so our next session is going to be on Thursday, the 1st of September, and we're fortunate to have Associate Professor Kelly Freebody, who's going to um, present to us. And she's going to be presenting a session on partnership research so I'm sure um, that um, like myself really looking forward to uh, to that session as well um, thank you everyone for coming along today big thank you to Kate for, for presenting um, if there are any questions or if you'd like to, to have any input or, or provide any feedback um, you can always drop me a line and um, I'm more than happy to um, to receive any any input or, or feedback from you. So go well everyone, stay safe and really looking forward to having you join us next time at uh, the Create HDR sessions.